ready? I'm ready, dude. All right, let's do this. So, welcome to the first Pipe Dreams <laughs> podcast, guys. <laughs> <laughs> this is the first one. We're gonna, like we said, we're gonna go in depth with the racing world and dig out stories that hopefully nobody has ever heard. I've got my good buddy here, Corey Alexander, a longtime friend, old teammate. Um, and we just decided to start this thing. And we're pretty late to the podcast world. We're here at our Cali studio in Chuckwalla, the Ocho, the garage, the infamous garage in Chuckwalla. <laughs> and uh, yeah, Corey, how you doing? I'm good. I'm good. We just had a good day of riding. We're lucky to have uh, have Joe out here hanging out with us. And just going to drop our first guest like that, huh? Just like that. Yeah, I mean, that's what we're here to do. Mr. Playboy. Mr. Playboy himself. <laughs> Mr. The, boy, the boy next door. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So, we got our first guest here. I don't think he needs any introduction. Joe Roberts. We're stoked to have you on as our first guest. <laughs> Thanks, man. Yeah, stoked to be here, man. So, you're here. We got you out riding Chuck Walla. How was it, man? It was sick. I got here last night. Slept in my van. <laughs> it's not insulated at all. It froze my ass off, but <laughs> had a great day of riding. That was it was really really fun to come out. Rode uh, one of your V2s. Yeah. Which was, yeah, it was sick. I haven't been here for like a year, so. Yeah, I mean, it's, we just moved to California and it's been raining for the last yeah, like the weather's two been weeks. Terrible, man. This yeah. is awful. The I think it might be warmer in New York right now, which is crazy. But, really? Yeah, I think so. Oh, man. I think so, if people are saying. But, but yeah, no, it was, it was great to have you. We just had a big crew of guys uh, that came out and were riding with us. Everyone was stoked to have you out once they figured out who you were. <laughs> 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 they were all like, you think we get a tell behind them? <laughs> <laughs> think we keep up with them? <laughs> we had uh, we had Greg White's brother Jeff White. Oh, yeah. He's he's the better White brother, but he was like <laughs> he was like I think I got something for him. <laughs> no way, dude! This track has gotten better. They repaved or like cleaned it up or something. You were saying they like it's repaved. Yeah, yeah, and it's so definitely much they resurfaced oh, okay. like a full repave. So yeah, they like you know ground down that first layer and then laid laid a new one down, which. For sure, made a lot better. I think you were here last year on, on a V4 or something, right? Yeah, there were some serious <laughs> cracks in this track. <laughs> Hanging onto a V4. Yeah, basically. <laughs> Just yeah. Your arms yeah. Off. Have you been riding uh, at all since the season ended? Yeah, I took I took some time off. I went to New York actually for two weeks, um, which was really nice. I, I have some a bunch of buddies that live out there, so stayed there for two weeks and went and like found this. Uh, this motorcycle shop built like this old 73 triumph uh 750 engine yeah i saw that it's a six street guys yeah that's six street yeah. cycles yeah. Yeah. yeah so that was really fun because i'm been pretty much never gotten into mechanics my whole career just kind of like let's yeah. make sure it works and ride <laughs> and like, so that. i can go ride it you know that's basically how i've always been um but more recently i've just gotten into it i think it's just so much uh so interesting how it all works and to like build something myself. So, um, spent some time there and yeah, I just took some time off Been playing a lot of music. Actually, I play like bass. Okay. Um, my brother and I play together and played some shows and stuff. So, um, that's been really fun. Something different, you know, the yeah. season's so long and like, it's good to just kind of do something different and just reset a little bit. But yeah. yeah. What, um, how'd you get hooked up with those guys in New York? Uh, I was doing, like a photo shoot for this thing and GQ. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. Have a comedy. <laughs> no way, man. Um, <laughs> come on, man. <laughs> um, no, but this guy was just like, I was going on about this triumph that I had done another shoot on. Yeah. Um, and I had so much fun riding this old sixties triumph. I'm a big fan of Steve McQueen. So like mm -hmm. whatever he was riding, I love, you know, and, uh, this guy was like, you got to go to this shop in New York. So I actually tried to go there in the summer, but they weren't there. And then this time they, they were, so it was cool. There's a little, uh, there's a little like short track, uh, by me in New York. And I think some of those guys go up there, but I know one of the kids, um, there's a kid that races flat track and like AFT from up, up by me. And he, he's like part of their crew. Yeah, um, I forget his name, but either way, yeah, it's a it's pretty neat. I didn't even know they were in the city, honestly. I didn't know where they were. Yeah, you gotta <laughs> go check them out, man. Next time you're in the city, yeah, it's it's, actually, it's like so sick. They just have pictures of like dirt trackers all over the walls, and he's built like tons of engines for people. And he's a big like this guy Hugh. He's a big dirt track fan. So mm. really, yeah, that's cool. That's crazy that I haven't heard of him. It's yeah. funny. There's like those like little underground kind of yeah, you know niche. Mm -hmm. 
people that are into that kind of stuff. But it's weird to hear about it in like New York City because you don't really think like New York City is gonna have anything motorcycle related. And if it is, it's kind of like a little bit cheesy. Yeah, know? man, it was sick. I this bought this engine just came in this box. Like I don't know where this engine came from. It was dirty as hell. <laughs> and I spent like three days just down in their like basement, basically they have like a parts washer down there, just all day just working. Hmm. And I was, you just doing? Yeah, me. I was cleaning what? all of it. Yeah, man. It was it Wait, was so hilarious. You were building the bike. Did I it, built the whole thing. Yeah. Holy crap! Did it run yeah. when you're done or not? Yeah. Huh? Did it run? I don't know yet. <laughs> <Gotta see. laughs> I hope it does. <laughs> but I was joking with my friend. I'm like, man, I'm I'm basically paying to have a nine to five right now. <laughs> I've never had a nine to five in my life, and I'm. This is what it feels like. Yeah. Wake up in the morning, get my coffee, bagel, <laughs> walk over to the, the shop. I work till six o'clock, get off work, go, you know, hang out with my buddy, go out or yeah. grab a drink or something, you well, know. We're hiring back at the dealership in New York. <laughs> yeah, so dude. If the racing thing don't work out, dude, we got a spot for you. Sick. Perfect. Glad to know. <laughs> That's cool, though. You said uh, you said you're playing some music with your brother. Uh, you got three brothers? Three brothers, yeah. Three. I, know, I knew the other two. I didn't know you... Had a third one like, until I started doing a little bit of research on you. I was doing a little background check. <laughs> <laughs> background check. Yeah. yeah, I have three brothers. We're all like two of us or three of us are all um, one year apart, which is kind of funny. Uh, never thought about that until I was older, how crazy it was that. Yeah. To that have, is crazy. Imagine being you know? a parent, having a kid, yeah. just yeah. knocking them out one after another. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, my That's mom did it. <laughs> but uh, my oldest brother is like four years older than me. So mm. we're all like really close and each other's best friends and stuff. So That's cool. Yeah, it's nice. You're the middle? Middle youngest. Yeah. 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 That's cool. So which one plays the uh, plays the bass? My younger... Well, I play bass. My younger brother is like... I'm playing his music. So he like... Uh, writes everything and plays guitar mainly, but can play anything. You're yeah. just slapping the bass around. Dude. Just, just, just taking it for a walk. I haven't got my <laughs> slap technique down yet. I'm working on it. Slap the bass, man. Yeah, <laughs> I'm really working on it. Right. But uh, yeah, I've always I've always been such a big lover of music and especially like um, really into like old style music, you know, mm. like Britpop, like the 80s music and... Um, yeah, so I, I don't know. I always loved playing bass and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's cool. Uh, are your parents both British? Mm-hmm. Oh, that's cool. When, oh, did they really? move, when did they move here? I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah, what? they're both British. <laughs> what? Yeah, I'm like first generation American. No way. Yeah. That's crazy. I was the first of my like brothers to be born. Oh, so they were all born in, in England. My Where? two older your, brothers two older were ones. born in England and me and my younger oh, brother. In Where America. at? In uh, Malibu. I was born. Oh, where were my yeah, parents yeah, from? Yeah, oh, yeah. Um, so my my mom is from like Bath. Okay. Yeah, like Bristol area, mm -hmm. and my dad is from like South London. Okay. Yeah. So. Giza. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So no, he doesn't really have that accent. No, I know. I, was, I know. I know. <laughs> he's pretty I know. proper. I just, I just he's pretty proper the way funny. he speaks, but um, yeah, it's funny. I've always had that kind of roots there. I always felt a real strong connection with England and yeah. anytime we race there. It's so, kind of funny because everyone thinks you're like the Cali kid, but then you have like the, the I know, English man. thing going on. That is on. wild, yeah. yeah. Kept it a like, secret up until <laughs> now. Oh, boy. We're dropping <laughs> stuff on the pod. How did, you, how did they end up in Malibu? Um, my dad is, uh, is in like the... Uh, ha my grandfather had this like camera, or it's like a robotic camera thing he designed mm. it's like called motion control like special yeah, yeah, effects yeah. stuff so okay my dad was like in the movie industry a little bit with commercial stuff too and um t took the company from england to america and uh yeah that's the camera control yeah camera yeah. control yeah that's why my dad is in america mm. i think he was supposed to come and just like help start the company and they're like, yeah, just go over there for a couple of weeks and help get it going. <laughs> Never left. And then my dad was Malibu like, uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't Could think I'm Could you imagine Joe Roberts just like wasn't born in America and just like, cheerio, mate. Hello, yeah, hello. <laughs> full Brit. Yeah, it would be funny. Tea. I still drink tea. So. Do you? What, what kind of tea? Earl Grey, man. English, really? English breakfast. No way. Earl Grey. Yeah. I'm more of a TB tips guy. Well, I, I can mess with that too. Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. I mean, I our next door neighbor Simon, he's always got that. Oh, that's all he has. Yeah, yeah. I actually, since I've moved to Europe, I've become. I never was like crazy about coffee, but I remember I was testing at uh, this track in Spain called Almeria, 
Uh, you probably know it. Yeah, Shag's yeah. Tires. Yeah, ter- like, <laughs> Shag's Tires. I don't like that track Neither at all. I think I. it's terrible. It's Shag's <laughs> it's Tires, terrible man. shit track. <laughs> but it's in the middle of nowhere, too, so... Um, it's where Tito did all of his stuff, right? Yeah, it's where Robat. he, like, lived. Dude, yeah, and, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, I remember I was there, and it got rained out. And, of course, this track, you can't ride in the rain. <laughs> it's too slippery or something. And I think that was the reason. But um, my teammate I had at the time, he's like, oh, mate, let's let's go grab a coffee. <laughs> And I just didn't really drink coffee. And all of a sudden, I have this, like, cafe con leche. And it was just, like, the best thing ever. I had, like, five. Yeah. I went back to the box. <laughs> Sounds like, like James. <laughs> just, like, addicted Dude. to coffee. So, yeah. First huh. time I went to Cartagena, it was, like, the same thing. Really? Yeah, I was, like, Spanish. They just love coffee oh, there. Oh, it's great. And then the first time I went to Italy, like, you get, the, like, <sighs> mud. It's so good. Yeah. It's... They, you just rip well my team is funny we have like a coffee machine i think they sp- oh. they told me how much they spend on an espresso <laughs> a year it's a it's a big part what's of the, the budget number? what's the number i don't even it's upwards <laughs> <laughs> it's up there <laughs> it's, it's, up there. it's, it's like dive. 15 over 15 i think what? Uh, something insane kind of i can like imagine i mean they started giving us coffee machines we use it so much and uh i mean dude they just like they have so many coffees a day and they'll watch me make my coffee and I'll <laughs> fill it like the little espresso shot all the way to the top. <laughs> they're and like, they're like, what, no, what the hell are you no doing? What is, what is that? <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> you know? They're like, it has to be like that yeah. tiny, you know? Yeah. Like, You're so American. <laughs> 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 With your Starbucks, you right? know? Yeah. yeah. Shit coffee. Exactly. I know, man. It's crazy. I just, the little sp- time I spent in Europe, it was very like that. And it got me to be a, more of a coffee snob myself. I mean, I got hooked on tea pretty good. But um, it's interesting just traveling around and seeing the different cultures. Like from, you know, living in America and then you go over there and you're kind of by yourself, right? Like we talked yeah. about it a little bit, just being over there. And it's you're like, man, like it's it's a lot different. Like even being in England where – you know, they speak English and it's pretty easy to get around except for they drive on the wrong side of the road. But it's yeah. like, it's quite, you know, depressing at sometimes being over there by yourself. <laughs> yeah. Like, I got no friends. I, no, I know, man. Honestly, I had that for a while. I mean, even still, I feel like I don't connect totally with everybody over there. A bit more on my, I have like a little group of people that um, I hang out with. I mean, Cam being over there and Cam Gish too. That was nice just to have that kind of fellow American to like hang out with that was really cool and also my my buddy who traveled with me Keaton um mm-hmm. I had that last year and that was great to have him there so and you guys were were you guys like doing a ton of stuff in Andorra for a bit no I'd never did the Andorra you, thing no. I, I, I've Portugal, gone a couple no? times Aren't I was you? in yeah I'm darting all over the place man <laughs> it's all right yeah so we're here to do yeah but uh, yeah I don't know I lived in Barcelona for a while and I think Barcelona's sick because like for the first years you get over there, I think it's important to just see that whole culture until you get sick of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> until you can't get into any restaurant, until you can't do anything. Yeah, I don't know. But yeah. <laughs> I think it's really cool, the culture and how much they love MotoGP. I mean, that's like here it's motocross, there it's road racing. You know, motocross is like second to the road stuff, which is so interesting. You it's know? crazy. Yeah. And like... Even just being in England, I know this is pretty far away, but like going into pubs and seeing like Taiko Suzuki or Paul Bird or, yeah. you know, like you don't see that going into a restaurant here, but like going over there and going into those restaurants, pubs or whatever, and everybody's talking bikes. You know, yeah. it's Superbike Sunday. It's not NFL Sunday. Yeah, I mean, football's huge, but it's pretty cool, the culture. Everybody rides to the track, and obviously the weather's so shitty in, yeah. in England that whenever they get a break – you know, and it's nice. Everybody comes out. You yeah. Know, everyone. So, like, Brands Hatch just being so full of fans and whatnot and racing in front of that is, is just, it's pretty, it's just a lot different. Yeah. You know? No, that's always something. Like we're spoiled here, for sure. Yeah. With the BSB stuff, I, I mean, I never, I think I've been maybe to a BSB race once, uh, or it was World Superbike at Donington. I can't remember. But, yeah, the the fans. No, I did. I went to Brands Hatch one time. And the fans there, I was like so surprised. It's packed. Yeah. It's wild. It was sick. I yeah. Loved, yeah, it was so cool to see. But no, the passion there is huge, man. You just see it. I mean, some some places like in Mizano, there's so many restaurants that are just filled with like bike fairings. What's you know? like your what's your craziest European story so far from like a fan fan perspective? Have a you had fan anything, perspective? Like, have anything like crazy happened to you? 
Dude, I mean, I had some stuff like uh, Barcelona. I had like this. I've had a couple times now. Girls coming up to me, <laughs> of course. With, <laughs> of course, with Bobby. <laughs> with uh, hello. <laughs> but they have their, my name tattooed on them. What? What? Yeah, no but way. not just mine. There's like other riders too. I'm, yeah, yeah, you sure. know, yeah, sure. Fabio's yeah. on there. Yeah. But it was crazy. Yeah. <laughs> it was crazy, man. I just was like, you actually did that? Yeah. You know, I mean, I'm. Did you ever get one signed and then they get it tattooed? I don't know. I, I, I signed I mean? some stuff, but <laughs> some we'll stuff. see next year, this year maybe. <laughs> yeah, some stuff. What kind of stuff we're talking about. <laughs> well, a couple of Talladega Nights type thing. You okay. Know? <laughs> okay. It's a different world, man. Yeah. It's wild. Or like Le Mans, like the, the bikes on the limiters for like four days straight. Yeah. Like when we did, I was with JP, we went to Le Mans 24 hour and mm -hmm. like, it's a Wednesday, bro. And they're just like, did, 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 did. And it's like, yeah. hey, it's five in the morning. I'm like, dog. I know, man. I, I, I think I was in Aragon and I was staying in uh, the town there, Alcaniz. And uh, man, that track, that little tiny, it's a little tiny town in the middle of nowhere. And that place comes alive during the GP. And I, one time, I can't remember if I was racing the GP or just going to see it. I think I was racing it. Um, I was staying in the hotel, like right at the square. Biggest mistake I've ever <laughs> made, man. I mean, it was just like all over the place, crazy noise. And I remember for a while after that, I was so sick of it. And then when 2020 came along and it was just nothing, silence, I was like, man, this sucks, you know, without yeah, all the people yeah. there. So now when I hear it, I'm like stoked. You I'm like, yeah, it. they're all back. You know, that's sick. But I was talking to Cam. Do you uh, do you stay at the track too? You know, this year he got like a camper at the track, and he's like, yeah, Cam was, got that from me because <laughs> he started coming around looking at mine and stuff. He's like, oh, this is pretty nice. Just staying here, you know. Yeah, I can't even imagine leaving the the track every night. Yeah, in those crowds, and then like I'd be, I get up pretty late. You I know? Get, so I would be showing up late missing they, practice they stuck have in traffic. Two, they have two different sizes. Like you can get the bigger one or the like single one. Mm -hmm. And Cam was asking me, he's like, what do you think? Should I get the single or the bigger one? <laughs> and I was like, dude, you only need the you only need the small one. But I was totally angling to just have there was one big one left. <laughs> and I was like, just <laughs> angling for my, me to get it. I was like, dude, you only need the small uh, one, man. He's like, Yeah, you're right, you're right. So how does that work? They tow they tow the same thing around the whole country for you? Yeah, the European rounds, right? Yeah, it's just like anything. I mean, the trailers that I mean, it's just so many trailers being towed around everywhere. But is it's it only a GP in room, or is it yeah a, GP room? Okay, yeah. Because yeah. I remember Brad when we went like the year before he was factory, we were staying in hotels, right? And like at Magello, you're staying like four miles away. And you, it's just like it's crazy. Like there are these little hotels. There's like the smallest bed. It's like the size of this couch. It's nothing great. It's nothing great. And then he, the year he got factory with KTM, we're in GP rooms, right? But he still had a hotel, but he stayed at the GP room. And I was like, it's way crazy because like Mugello is like one way in, one way out. Mm. So it's like super hard to get to the track. And it's like insane. Like if you're late, like you're fucked. Yeah. Like dude, FP1's rolling, bro. <laughs> <laughs> They're not, not waiting. They're not waiting, dude. <laughs> not waiting. Yeah. No. no, that's true. I mean, there's that. Like when the, the crowds are so intense, I mean, it's just a level of stress that – is eliminated you know you're already at the track you don't have to think about it and it kind of reminds me when i was a kid and going to the track with like a motorhome and you know with my dad and stuff it's just a similar feeling so yeah um yeah i've got my little routine you know you just wake up do do your thing go have breakfast at the hospitality um get ready go see the team get ready for fp1 you know so it's it's yeah it's nice to be there at the track now how does that so you did did you do a year in hotels and then get into a gp box like how does that work is that just like anything per team did you have to work that into your deal to get it that or is that on you or how does that because i know the european contracts and stuff like that they're, it's a little different it's not quite you know hey we pay for travel we pay you it's like it's kind of somewhat jumbled sometimes yeah i mean that's always dependent on like the team you're with what yeah. they're willing i mean everyone's got a different contract different deal or you know whatever they're getting um yeah i kind of just worked it in good kind of thing um or you just offset compared to like what a hotel would cost for the year is it pretty you know? comparable i mean, it's a little bit more but but it's worth you're there i think it's worth it yeah, yeah for sure peace of mind yeah yeah 
Do you totally. have like a a crew? Like Cam was saying, that was kind of like what changed for him when he started to kind of really enjoy it. I know Cam's like a little bit more of a home homebody kind of guy. Yeah. So that's a big part of it is like yeah. having people around him that he wants to be around. But um, and he said he kind of made friends with like Jake and a few of those guys. You have like a kind of a, a click as well over there for yourself. Or I would one say man, that. You're a one man lone, lone wolf. I mean, I have like Keaton. Yeah, the Americans and, are your buddy. Or whatever, yeah, and Cam too and stuff. But I mean... I don't know. I feel like a little bit maybe different the way I go about things and don't always like relate to a lot of people. So I do kind of my own thing a little bit. Yeah. But what, what do you mean by that? Like what way? Um, I don't know. I don't really always want to talk to people at the track, man. <laughs> you know, you never know what yeah. I've never I've had friends at the track before. But um, I mean, racing to me is just such like a thing in my head. It's like my own inner battle. You know, I don't need another distraction from, you know, someone else. Yeah, saying, so you're one of those guys you just want to go home and think about whatever you got to do and go back to work the next day kind of thing. Not really make friends kind of deal. Well, I don't know. but I mean, I have friends. I yeah. have friends I grew up with. And, like, <laughs> I'm not, like, a complete loner. But um, I just mean at the racetrack. Like, yeah, you're there the to do a track. job and, like, you just want to get shit done. I mean, I'm not an asshole. I'm, like, friends with people. And, like, yeah. if I see somebody that is, you know, We'll wave back, you know, I'll I'll do that type of stuff. But yeah. you're not gonna go have a beer with them, is what you're saying. I mean, it is funny. I, like sometimes you'll get like the after parties and you, you run into riders and it's always kind of a nice thing just to be like because I have a lot of respect for everyone I race against. Of course. Mm-hmm. You know. Um, just cause I think we're all understand each other what what it takes to go through this, you know. So um you know, it, it is nice in like kind of a relaxed setting to kind of just unwind and be like, hey, man, you know, it's good, good to see you or whatever. Or, yeah, that, that type of thing. I think that's healthy. But when you're in the zone and you're trying to figure out how to get through a weekend and there's so much stuff going on, I, I just try to I just try to direct all my like communication to my team, whatever friendships and all that type of stuff. And um, maybe it's just my own thing. I don't know. Maybe I can't be can't separate my mind to just be friends with other people. I got to just direct it certain ways, you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, I mean, I think that's something that a lot of people have said, like racing has changed over the years. Right. Cause it used to be like, you know, you like, you wanted to kill the guys you were racing against, not like literally, but like that was like the mindset. And now everyone's kind of gotten to be a little bit more like buddy, buddy. You kind of got your, your group of people you hang out with. And then, yeah. I mean, that can be nice, yeah. but also kind of boring sometimes. I think it's interesting to have a bit of that kind of, rivalry yeah for you sure. know for so sure. who who would you say your rivalry your rival is like your <laughs> ultimate Dude, who's your pick, guy pick like f- 10 riders <laughs> on the know, right? grid, man i mean there's so many good ones uh it's hard to to pick one honestly did um, you uh have you ever got like like your first wild card at where was your first wild card Bruno, right because that was a stellar right in the rain yeah that's what like was like our homies there yeah <laughs> we're in it boys no, but like did anybody cut you up like right off the bat. Oh, dude. <laughs> yeah, okay. Because <laughs> I had I had it pretty gnarly. Like, yeah. I did a wild card at Indian. Yeah. Like I roll out of pit lane and it was West. Dude just cut me up and I'm like, bro. <laughs> no, there's like it's my first job. It's my first time, dog. No, like, there's a like, level of like you gotta earn your yeah. spot in the field. Huh. You oh know? yeah. I think that's that's huge in that paddock too. I remember the difference like when I in 2020 when I came out of Qatar you know, the difference that people reacted towards me in the paddock compared to like the years before. I mean, the years before I had little signs of getting the points or, but I wasn't really doing anything, you know, I mean, just trying to find my way in this class Mm -hmm. and uh, riding bikes that were like not coming to me, you know, it was Mm -hmm. difficult to to ride. Um, So like 2020, when it started kind of coming a little bit together that, you know, the people that kind of Oh hey Joe, how are you doing? Or they wave a little. Everyone's a little bit nicer, yeah, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So there is that level thing. And I remember in Brno, one thing that was funny. Um, man, I remember Remy Gardner <laughs> pulled <laughs> a move on me that I thought was just like I was like, okay, that's that's you know. Yeah, with he's, the big dogs now. <laughs> yeah, he he. I mean, he passed me, but he did. He could have passed me a little bit, like with more space, and he just took everything. Dude, they buzz you. Yeah, but that never bothered me, man. Yeah. I mean, racing in America, yeah. I remember 2014, Danny Eslick, all year, man, he would pass me like <laughs> such an asshole, man. <laughs> I mean, there was times like in uh, Daytona, I was, you know, in Daytona, you got the white line at the top and like the line is like, stay up as close to the wall as possible. 
I mean, I wasn't riding the wall just because I'm like, I don't, you know, I don't need to do that. I'm riding a Honda that's 10 miles an hour slower. Let me just get through this week. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I remember Danny, I was like pretty close to the wall. And dude, he goes around the outside of me, like, I mean, centimeters from me, man. It was the craziest thing ever. <laughs> dude, that's so slick though. Yeah, that it is, is totally him. You know, it's like maybe that dirt track thing. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. But I respect that, honestly. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's cool. That's wild. I think we talk about it, it's like when we go back to Bruno and we see like I think it's like the it's like a confidence thing that you're not like nothing changes but like I don't know like the aurora around you like people are a little bit more like whoa like this guy is somebody you know what I mean like I don't know how to say it but it's like when you make that or if you do something to you know one of the big dogs you make a, a pass or something that's good but yeah. hard you know, I feel like people just like it rattles through the paddock. Yeah. You know, and it, it's crazy. Like my next question for you is like, how hard is it? You know, what I mean, like I had my like one wild card, and it's, it's hard. But like, you're on pretty good bikes and stuff like that, and it's still like super hard. But like, how hard is it? Yeah, I think it's a question that like people are always trying to figure out. You know, especially coming like the riders from here, always trying to figure out what how hard is it. Um, and it's really difficult to gauge, you know, cause there's no real reference in a way. Um, the bikes are way different. The mm -hmm. tires are different. The tracks are different. So it's just kind of like, a, uh, yeah, you got to take a leap of faith when you go over there and just, just hope that it, you know, believe in yourself and just know you can try to come out and you are a good rider, you know, but yeah. it is, it is difficult. I mean, the things that I think, uh, throw you is just like your own inner mental battle. You know, if you didn't have a good session, maybe over here, it'd be like top five, top seven over there. It's <laughs> like you see yourself out of the, you know, the transfer position into Q2 and you're like, this is a shit weekend, you know, yeah. or you're not on the camera anymore. You know, there, it's just, it's cutthroat, but you're racing against the best. There's no excuses, man. You got to either do it or don't, you got to make it happen. So, um, when do you think you realize like you could actually like you belong there was there ever a doubt for you or yeah you, totally you all man. The time? no i had doubts a lot i mean i remember 2019 when i was riding the ktm i was like am i am i even good enough to do this you know is this is this what i should be doing was there like a moment though that then that like flipped and you were like okay like i'm yeah i remember going into the off season 2019 to 20 and uh i was like i was lost i didn't know what I was going to do. I was thankful I had the like, Calyx going into the next season. Mm. You know, a new bike, same mm -hmm. bike as what all the top guys were on. Um, felt confident with the crew chief I had that year. Felt confident with uh, John Hopkins, who I was working with. He was kind of a real, he helped me kind of boost myself up, honestly, if I think about it. Um, I really like John a lot. I think we had a, a really good relationship and still do. But at that time we were working together, it kind of... Uh, yeah, it really helped. Um, I went to Qatar for the test and I didn't really have any expectations. I just was, let's just see what happens. And that track to me is just always fast and flowing stuff has always spoke to me a little bit. There's a sector like sector three at Qatar. It's just those fast rights. Mm -hmm. That stuff just speaks to me so much. And uh, I think I finished top 10 in the test. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, okay, that's cool. That's something new, you know? And I started to like, Feel that little energy inside of you that's like you know that thing you just follow yeah, maybe i could do it <laughs> yeah i can do this you know i can do this yeah, and yeah. free practice the ne on the actual race weekend i free practice too i went out my first run and my crew chief came to me and he said joe your ideal time is a 58 5 and i was like thinking i was like what the hell no way it's 58 5 i mean that's like almost a track i think i was like the track record or something like, there's no way he's like just i'm putting new tires on just go for it and I remember just putting a lap together and I set the lap record and I was like, holy shit, I can, you know, this <laughs> yeah. is insane. And I just carried that. I mean, I've just always carried that feeling that I, I know I can still do it yeah. and have that within me. Was um, there something in like that off season that you were doing differently other than like, I mindset? don't think so. No. I mean, I, what that before 2020, Yeah, yeah. no, I think I was the most lost I've ever been like training wise. I'd had like crazy structured training through my whole career up until that point. And that year it was just like, I don't know, just, yeah, obviously I was training and riding and mm -hmm. stuff, but I always do. But 
it wasn't like super focused on any point. Um, maybe that was the good thing I got on my own head, you know? Yeah, for just, sure. And just did what you were able to do. Yeah. You know, I, I think, think sometimes that's, you know, it happens. You yeah. just like, you don't do what you're like bred to do, like your talent. It's not second nature. You know, it's, you know, it gets, gets a little tough, but yeah, I remember seeing that. And I think, you know, all of America, I think was like, just, yeah. You know, like you've got your one or two guys. Like, Everybody wants a horse in the race. Well, it's like, <laughs> I mean, and it's America. You know yeah. what I mean? We're like, we're a huge country and we're great at everything. Yeah. And it's like, we've been a little lost in there. And it's, uh, I think it's tough when you only have like one guy, whereas if Spaniards or Italians, there's so many, you know, they, if, you know, Bastianini at the time doesn't do it, we've got six other guys that can do it. Yeah. You know, we've got you uh, Cam and once and you know a few other guys in our whole you know time so it's like well, I remember when we saw that and you know just seeing everybody just get right behind the boy and was yeah. like yeah let's go and I mean does that does the social media help you too or was does it is it a distraction oh I think it's it goes hand in hand I mean it's both you know it yeah be, it can be your like a good friend or it can be your worst enemy man I mean I think uh I remember that weekend especially when I like qualified on pole, I couldn't sleep that night because I just knew how big a deal it was that yeah. this had happened, you know, and I could just feel the energy around the world that was like, okay, there's a possibility we could win. Um, I think I was a little nervous that weekend. Uh, I would in, hope. In the race. <laughs> I don't think like, you could what was not it, be. <laughs> what's it like being on the grid, like your first pole, like lap record, like yeah. just out of kind of nowhere? Right, uh, dude. It, butterflies were everywhere. I mean, I had my dad next to me, which was great, and my crew chief, who at that the crew chief I had at the time was very good at like diffusing my own head. Mm -hmm. You know, he kind of was very good at just talking to me, like jokingly, and getting me out of my own way. And yeah. I think that helped a lot. Um, the thing about that race, though, we there was kind of a question about the soft tire. Some were like working, and some not. It was kind of it was weird. Um, because some riders in that race just dropped way back and had issues. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we we opted to go for a hard tire, which I hadn't used all weekend. And I remember kind of having a bit of like doubts about it. But I mean, it was still a great, great race, man. Got up in the front and yeah, it was, battling. It was unreal. Yeah. But um, what um, obviously you said working with Hopper was was a big thing. Like what? What uh, what did he bring to the table for you? Like, what was the big? I know I know he's like I read his book, you know, and I I've always obviously been a fan just because he's you know a legend. But from a from somebody who like doesn't really know him personally, like to read some of the stuff that he worked on and like what made him so great was kind of interesting because it was a little bit different, I think, than most yeah. racers' mindsets and like their approach. So I'm kind of curious, like, what was uh, what was that for you? Well, it's funny with John because I always felt kind of a connection with him since I was a kid you know, watching that movie faster that he was in and uh, kind of seeing his upbringing. He kind of had, Brit he had British parents too um, and similar upbringing, same tracks, Southern California and uh, similar riding stuff too. I mean, so you we, rode flat track growing up, supermoto flat track. And then I did. Yeah. I think he was more like motocross and yeah. stuff, but we rode the same road race tracks mm. like Apex and, or Adams and Apex too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, um, I mean, he was just so positive and it was kind of just like, it, he gave the, uh, impression was like, without a doubt, you can do this. There was no like doubts, whatever, you know, it was just like, yeah, what do you mean? I've seen you ride. You can do this. <laughs> Almost like a shield maybe. Yeah. And it just felt like something I hadn't had forever. I was in environments that were felt a little bit more antagonistic and more cold. You know, there wasn't such like a person that was like, I really could connect with. Um, and his own background, I respected a lot. Just, I always, you know, he was a, one of the Americans like Nikki and yep. Colin that I idolized, you know, so to have him in my corner felt, it was just felt like an extra motivation. Um, yeah, some of the best races I had that year was just me and him beforehand, just shooting the shit about, you know, random stuff didn't even have anything to do with racing. Yeah, yeah. So it was more than just the racing connection. It's just as a person too, so. Do you have a coach now that you're working with or like a, you know, like a mentor type of person? Obviously, you're not working with John anymore, I don't think, right? No, I, I right now, no, I don't. It's more just on my, like, own thing. Um, but I have, like, a really, the team I'm in right now, the Italian trans team, I mean, they're, like, 
just such like nice, supportive people. You know, there's times I've like crashed out of the lead or things like that. And they're not, any other team would just be so livid. You know, I was coming in expecting like things to be thrown and it was not the case. You know, Le Mans 2021, uh, I was in second and had such good pace. I was catching, I was, I think I could have just passed Bezeki the next corner, but um, he kind of broke a little bit sooner than I thought and I almost ran to the back of him so that I crashed. And I was livid, so pissed at myself that I did it. And the team was just so understanding. And they saw it more as like a positive thing that, oh yeah, Joe can do this. You know, he's running up front. So that was, that. that's something that's been really cool about this team, you know? That's awesome. Now, going on to that, like sometimes we see like, you know, like a lot of crashes just kind of out of nowhere, you know, or tuck in the front and stuff like that. And is that because you were so on the limit or is it like a certain lean angle? But like we see a lot of mistakes just like kind of out of nowhere. Whereas you, you know, as a fan watching, you're like, wow, like how did that just happen? Yeah. Is that just because like it's on the limit for 45 minutes or whatever, 38 minutes and you're just, you're literally, everybody's just on this limit? Or what is that? Is there a feeling thing? Are the bikes, I mean, when I rode it, there was a lot of chatter. I'm sure there's so much better now, but like, like yeah. what is, can you give us any input on like how the bike, you know, reacts like that? Is there a, a lot of feel out of the Moto2 bike or is it kind of like you're just sending it? Um, I wouldn't say that, I, I would say they're kind of difficult bikes to, to really ride super, super well. To okay. like, to do really, there's like a pocket, I think at least for me, that I find when I enter that window, it's, I can do like really good things. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, they can be like a little bit difficult, you know? I mean, Barcelona this year, I was uh, probably the most confident I'd been all year. Um, I'd like led sessions that weekend, qualified third, um, and I took off in the race. I was like four seconds in the lead. Checked out. And I felt so confident, you know? And I remember just thinking like, okay, keep 44, eight, that's the pace. And I was monitoring it with my board and seeing I was like making gaps. And, um, but the thing was, is it was getting hot and the tire was overheating and I didn't think about it, you know? I mean, I thought about it, but I didn't really like take it into such big consideration that mm -hmm. I needed to back it off a little bit. And, um, yeah, I just made a, a little mistake. It gave me a warning, like a couple, like a lap before that the front was starting to move. And uh, I was just so like content on just keeping forty four eight, you yeah. know, because it's e yeah. it's weird how easy it is to do that on a Moto two bike to keep the same tenth. Really? Yeah, it's so weird. I, it feels like I can't do anything different, and this, you know, it, it it works in your favor and against you too, because when you're trying to go quicker, you're like, shit, I can't <laughs> go any quicker, you yeah. know. So it's the same lap time, but then if you're trying to keep pace too, it's it's weird how you just can do this. Feels like the same thing. I, I think I did like maybe f seven forty four sevens, and you know it's just it's weird. But um, but yeah, the fronts can just be a little bit tricky sometimes, and just kind of close on you. Cam was saying about the the chassis are so stiff that they put so much force through the tires. Yeah, that Dunlop has made those those tires like super stiff to to handle the the load, and and so yeah. they have a tendency to you know tracks especially like when it's colder. When you go to a, a side of the tire that you're not using a lot, the tendency to fall because of that and those kinds of things, you, you had a lot of experience with that too. Yeah, well, the thing is, is, compared to like Michelin or something like that, Dunlop's pretty limited on the compounds because they have to make a tire that can like work for every type of track. I mm -hmm. mean, you got different, con you'd have different uh, abrasions on all sorts of tracks, different weather, um, yeah, temperatures and stuff like that. So um, sometimes they work great and sometimes maybe that allocation isn't like perfect, you know? So, it takes like a, a lot of rider, you know, light riding skill to, to work understand, with that. Yeah. yeah. And understand it. And, um, yeah, but it is true. Yeah. Sometimes they don't feel as good as and it could be the same compound, but it just doesn't feel as good as the day before or, you know, a different track. Yeah. yeah. And, oh, I was going to say, and you're only allowed so many tires per, like you, you can't just go in if you get like six front, six rears. You can't just get the same compound six and six, right? You you get like three hards, three softs, or whatever it is per weekend. Yeah. So like normally the allocation is the tire that they know that nobody's going to use. They'll do less. So it'd be 
depending on the track. Um, some tracks, they split it evenly because it's like there could be a chance you want to use the soft or the hard. But um, tracks that are like obvious that you're going to use the soft, they'll do maybe five, um, like number twos, let's say. Mm -hmm. And they'll do three number threes. Uh, but you know you're just going to use... So strategy and all that comes into play a little bit. Yeah, and the front tires too, you have five of each, like three and two. I always use a harder front tire. Um, a lot of riders do, except for Phillip Island, we use the soft one. Um, but yeah, you try to just structure it. I mean, free practice one, you always just use your your least desirable tire and and just get used to the track mm -hmm. again, kind of see all your points where you get to, get to know it again. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> you know? Um, and, and I mean... Like, I don't want to jump back, but go into, like, you say, when you get into that pocket and you can do those, like, 44 eights and whatnot um, the whole time, is it physical? Like, are you, is it, I mean, obviously it's physical, but, you know, how physical is it? Um, I mean, depends on the circuit. I mean, Coda is so physical that those switchbacks that you got in that first sector, or maybe it's the second sector, those are so physical. And, like, race like lap after lap after lap i mean you're just yes yeah, I mean, it gets to you after a while but um it just depends on the track i mean i think it's down to your fitness you know how, yeah how fit you are but do you get arm pump i i actually don't ever get arm pump i've never had the surgery or anything okay mm. just the way i ride i always ride like my f fingers basically i just i don't know i just never had that kind of grip thing um how much of it do you think comes down to fitness? I would say a good amount. Yeah. That plays into like how mentally fatigued you get too. Uh, for me, that's like the biggest thing is kind of knowing. It's not so much even out there like being physically fit. It's more so knowing that you're potentially more fit than the guy next to you. Yeah. Thing, I you think know? mentally it's like a huge thing. Knowing you're prepared and ready for the weekend, you eliminate all variables, yeah. you know, by and being fit. Do you think it's like a fitness like cardio or do you think bike fit is more in that sort of championship or do you think you need to have like a good combination i mean honestly looking at like what the whole field does is just ride motorcycles constantly, constantly. i mean the whole vr46 i don't even ever see them riding bicycles <laughs> i know no, I don't they're think all I they're do. doing is just riding motorcycles which i think i'm more kind of inclined to do now um yeah that's kind of my mentality right now it's just like ride 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 because yeah. i think that's brings on more of the it's like hard to like focus on the muscles that are needed because it's just such a specific type of sport i've gone to like gyms before where they're like so what muscles do you use for this and i'm like well almost everything <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> well you need to have Biceps. strong you need to have strong <laughs> forearms like dude no yeah exactly no <laughs> yeah you yeah. know like you can't be holding those like grip things because i just like yeah mess up your forearms and stuff so i see you work out at the red bull uh place in la what is that like that's great i mean they understand the sport really well and they have a whole section facility like mental performance and stuff like that which has been really helpful um and yeah just like top trainers yeah being with red bulls helped a lot for that too the training side it's pretty cool i mean i feel like as i mean you were a red bull rookie so you kind of know that was like younger but like growing up and being like a true red bull athlete's like yeah as a, as a you know racer or anybody that's in this kind of stuff is like that's like a you know box to check for sure yeah it's like full circle for me like they kind of showed me Europe with the Red Bull Rookies Cup. So it's pretty sick to be back with them. And I always wanted to be with Red Bull. So, yeah, it's really cool to be with them. And they just, like, really care about their athletes, you know? Yeah, no, it's cool. I mean, it's it's honestly amazing. What Like, it's an energy drink company, like, all the stuff that yeah. they do out, outside of that. I don't think a lot of people realize, you know, no, they how much they actually invest in, in the athletes and stuff. Yeah, so helpful with, like, videos you want to do or – I mean, like the actual thing to help you become a better athlete, which is like their whole, um, it's, they call it APC, mm -hmm. the athlete performance center. I mean, that just is like such a huge help. I, I've met so many other Red Bull athletes at that place and it's kind of, that's another thing that's pretty cool to like meet them. Yeah. You're kind of like a, an elite, yeah. <laughs> elite squad. <laughs> yeah, elite squad. <laughs> it's like the X-Men. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's are cool. you, uh, are you on any sort of diet restrictions? Like I know we know. Um, back when the Hondas, they're a little bit slower and you don't, you, there was a weight limit and whatnot. Is there, uh, 
is there a certain weight you look to go into the season to be lighter is faster or there's a certain weight that you feel comfortable that you know traveling the world getting sick has to be a huge variable yeah um you pasta know. in Italy. <laughs> Italian team. <laughs> Go fast to eat pasta. <laughs> no, dude, there is. I mean, I'm pretty, I'm like on the taller side for Moto2. You know, I'm like f- almost six foot. So, um, I mean, it's it like weight for me is so important. I try to be, I try to be around like 69 kilos. But the weight like cap, I think the perfect weight is 65 kilos. I do it in kilos just because I've been yeah. over there for so long. Yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. You all, lost me. <laughs> what I know. I think it's... 72, I think it's like 163 or something, oh, okay. 164. Yeah, and I think one... I always try to be around like 150. Mm. Okay. 49, basically. Um, it's a which, side subject. I was on the phone with Gerloff the other day. Oh, dude. He's, he, I, yeah. <laughs> men's health. First of all, men's, men's health. health figure. But oh, he's like, he's like, yeah, dude, Christmas is brutal. I've been on this diet. Like, you know, I'm at like 160. I'm trying to get down to 145. All I've been doing is eating meat. Yeah, dude. He, <laughs> like, I've been hanging out with him a lot, actually, when I was living in Spain. And he's on this like whole, uh, I think he's super into the whole carnivore. Oh, he is. Dude. Oh. Getting into all of that and like. That's my dad. My dad's into that big. Really? Yeah, I like, thought you said that was your dad. I was no, like, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Big Phil's been in. He's been, uh, what, eating meat with maple syrup and papayas. No. And like. <laughs> and then he's like, man, I got to get into surfing because, you know, I'm not burning enough to eat the fruit. So, like, <laughs> yeah, or like Liver King. Dude, that, that guy's a fraud, right? Yeah, he's, he's, I, I think he's a fraud. Either. Well, yeah. The, Came out, he's the on emails. steroids. Oh really? Yeah, he yeah. was doing like ten grand worth of uh, steroids a, a month, <laughs> dude. He was like, and my favorite is all these memes are you know whatever these the guys are going. Yeah, no, I'm I'm natural. No, I don't take it. And then everyone's <laughs> yeah. just lighting him up. <laughs> dude, so funny. Yeah, that's Gerloff without the steroids. <laughs> but he's into all that eating meat, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but it's crazy. I mean, I'm six four. I can't even imagine like. I weigh 165, which I couldn't, I couldn't lose weight. I don't think if I tried, I can't imagine like for you, same thing. It's probably pretty difficult to get any lighter than you are. Well, I've had like trouble sleeping sometimes too. I've gone like crazy. Like I did this whole, like, um, during 2020, I'd like, when we'd come back from all the sitting around for those three months, I weighed like so much going into her (laughs) F and I had two terrible weekends. I mean, I did terrible. I was like 16th or something. And uh, between, it was like Hareth and Bruno. And I was like, I'm not, this isn't happening. Bruno is like my track. I'm going to like change this. And I went on this, I was like living in the Spanish mountains. <laughs> like, Smoking I like, but, cigarettes. No, no, no. Rocky, he's like, he's got Rocky. He's just literally has stones. He's just. <laughs> Dude, it was crazy. I like, I went into this whole thing. I was like, I'm not eating dinner till, <laughs> till Bruno. Like I'm not eating any dinner. Just and fasting. I worked out, I worked, I would wake up and I'd do, uh, like a two hour walk in the mountains or something, or I'd run it, uh, with Edgar Pons. I was yeah. staying with him. And then, uh, at the end of the day, we, I would have like my little lunch, uh, which was like just salad and chicken. I had like toast and like yogurt for the, the morning <laughs> or something. So it wasn't like a no carb thing, but it was like, no, basically I wasn't eating much. And then in the evening I would do like two hours of trials riding in the, the mountains too. And I lost, uh, I lost like 10 pounds or something crazy, like 12 pounds or something between that race and Bruno. And I had a crazy good weekend in Bruno too. So that's it, dude. That's the, that's it. Yeah. So sometimes you just like have to go to the extremes, but yeah. What's about that track? That seems to be a good spot for you. It's just one of those like tracks that just like fast and flows, just so much flow to it. You know, it's very wide. I can use like these big wide sweeping lines carry my corner speed that I love so much. Yeah. You know, where was it that was it Barber? Was it Barber that you showed up for the first race here and like you, you smoked everyone oh, in 2013. Yeah. Yeah. I, we raced each other the, yeah. like a couple of weeks before that. I was literally just, I was going to bring it up. But yeah. Did you beat me that weekend? Yeah, I did. <laughs> dude, <laughs> I've been waiting. His resume. I've been waiting, dude. I've been waiting this whole time. I think it was a close battle. It was so close. Yeah. I, I remember him showing up and you had, you were on the Ulrich Honda. Yeah. We were at Celtic and I just, just wadded the thing up over the top of the, uh, we're in the back seat before the long right. I high sided out of there. Do you remember? And um, I remember you were there and it was like, 
we were just fucking going back and forth. Yeah. And I was like, there's no fucking way I'm letting this guy beat me. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, cause you were young and yeah, I feel like, like you 15. just got on a 600. Yeah, and I'm like, that was my first time ever on a 600. I'm like, dude, no <laughs> fucking way is this happening. And I remember I just like squeaked it out and Barry Gilson is like, my boy, my boy. <laughs> it's like, like, uh, oh, the hardest we race I've ever raced. Oh, so shit. Then you showed up and you were, you were like just turned 16 for your yeah, first that was my birthday like two weekend. days after or something like that yeah. Right? yeah that's crazy see it helped dude you helped me man you're my reference you <laughs> showed me the lines i did what i did because of you oh, man. yeah right <laughs> oh man what um times. i'm curious so like 2020 you had a lot of momentum right and then 2021 obviously switched teams what what was the the change for you that you know it seemed like initially it was a little bit of a different environment or something like that and things kind of were a little bit more tough again for you was that what was that all about what like the the change? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I just I I there were some things I wasn't totally happy with where I was at, and I just wanted something different. And at the time, Ital Trans had just won the title, and I thought it was the right move for me, you know, to to make that switch to like win, start winning consistently. Um, I mean, that year didn't really turn out how I thought it was going to uh, for for a whole team, but I mean, we had some some decent races and ran up front sometimes and wasn't like a, a disaster year, but, um, definitely w wasn't my best, but I think I just, I really wanted to be still want to just be a consistent front runner and learn from, to be a really good rider before I'd go up to the big class. You know, I just want to go up to the big class and, you know, figure it out. I wanted to be like a strong top, top rider and, and dominant in this moto two to have that feeling it's almost for myself to be like confident going into MotoGP sure. yeah, yeah. you know to feel that I would like perform well there because you're going up against Marquez you're going up against yeah, the best, the, the best yeah. of the whatever Moto2 has to offer so if I'm not the best in Moto2 you know it's like yeah would like do you think there is what was the biggest struggle about that transition to, to Tao Trans? Was, was there a struggle or just taking time for you to get settled in yeah I think I mean there's different things like they're an all Italian team, you know, to speak Italian and stuff. So there was that. Do you speak Italian? I don't know. I thought I remember you on the thing. You were trying to learn it, right? Yeah. Duolingo. Yeah. Yeah, because that, that's me right now. It's Spanish. Like really, forty six days. I'm going strong, boys. But <laughs> is it is it hard in the box when you don't understand the language? At first, it was. It's get it's gotten a lot better, and um, a lot of people there speak English too. And having like someone with me, like Keaton has been really helpful too, like a fellow American. Does he speak Italian or no? No, he okay. doesn't. But it's it's nice <laughs> no, to just, just have somebody yeah. there. 100%. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, for you. It makes you feel like you're not crazy if they don't get what you're saying. Kind yeah, of thing. I mean, there is that. I mean, the language barrier is, is a difficult aspect to it. But, um, I mean, the, like I said, I think the team knows how to win. I know how to win. So uh, it, it's just a matter of it all coming together, which I think this year we've got a good shot at that. Now, going from like a Calyx to a Calyx, is there much different? Do you notice a big difference between the two teams? Yeah, or just like, a and are they are they different chassis or are they identical? No, the chassis is the same, okay. but the way that they're set up is a little bit different. Um, different approach to it, mm -hmm. basically. Um, so yeah, there are differences, but and you can't change like electronically. How much can you change? Are they still locked down? I know the Triumph, they were allowed to do like a little bit of TC and some EBC strategies and stuff. No, do you get crazy with that or no? No TC. Okay. You're only allowed um, torque management. Okay. So basically it's just like having a softer map. Okay. So it's, yeah, you just open the throttle. It's like just delayed mm -hmm. the, the opening of the, the throttle basically, um, which can be helpful in like the rain or maybe on tracks that are a little slippery. Do you, um, are you full power? I mean, we don't want to get into your setup and stuff, but like, no, I don't care. Do you, do you, I mean, do you just, do you just, is it full stick all the time or? Yeah. I normally keep like a one-to-one, -one, they okay. call it, um, just full power. Yeah. Sometimes I like having a little bit, some, like a softer thing. If it's maybe like a track that the, you know, the first touch, like the edge grip's not there. Mm -hmm. I like having a little bit softer just cause it kind of helps that first part not to step out too much. You kind of just have it a little bit softer. Um, but I think the main thing that's huge is, uh, engine brake that plays a huge deal and like how well the bike stops getting it positioned for the corner. Um, that's a big deal. And have you seen a transition from, you've been in there 
three years? Four? Is this your fourth year? No, it's like my sixth year. Okay, cool. Because I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I did a lot of research. Um, but six years. Have you seen a big transition in style change? Like, cause I, when they started, it was full lock back in, or, yeah. or, or getting in, park it, and going. Now it's wheels have kind of come back in line a right. little bit, and but we're starting to see a lot of like manageable slides on exits and pushing that boundaries. Has there been a huge style change during your six years that you've had to grasp, or have you feel like you've kind of um, obviously you've adapted a little bit, but have you had to make a style change? No, for sure. I mean, like when I got there, it was still the Honda engines. Yeah. And you didn't have like auto blip or anything. You mm -hmm. just had like quick shifter and they were slow? like a slipper clutch. It felt, no, they weren't that slow, honestly, but it felt more like a super moto bike. You know, when you downshift, you just like pull it in, let the thing just back it in. It was, I thought it was more like more spectacular in a way. Yeah. But, um, I mean, the bikes now are cool. They have more power, which is kind of nice. It changes a little bit the way you approach the corner, less, you know, lean it, like less lean angle, uh, less like a 250 is like the reference. I feel like, okay, you know, two stroke kind of thing. It's more in line with like super bike or more power, okay. you know, like when you ride a bike with more power, you almost like make yep. a V out of the corner. So maybe it's helping to get to MotoGP a little bit, or do you think it's, it's in that direction? Yeah. Yeah. But the jump's got to be so crazy. Yeah. No, I've talked to riders that made the jump, and they're like, it's a whole different world. Could you imagine being a Moto3 guy and jumping? like To MotoGP? Yeah. Yeah, like, that sounds nuts. <laughs> like there's only, what, Jack Miller and, and Darren Bender? are. Yeah. Those are the two? I mean, I think he did a couple Moto2s. and whatnot, But, like, like, that seems crazy. Yeah. No, it does. I know it's a hot subject, or at least it was, but... Like talk us through the whole the whole process of making that decision on the Aprilia thing. I don't know. I assume that's true, but yeah, know. no, it was for sure. I mean, when that came about, I think it's uh, it was kind of an interesting point. I was already signed to Tal Trans, and it was the last race of the year that they approached me. Um, so there's a lot of conflict in my own head because I was already signed to a team, and didn't morally feel right to just be like. You know, and there was a lot of questions in my head, like why it took so long to come to me at that mm -hmm. point, you know, felt very last minute and that put me on edge a little bit. Kind of like a last resort type of thing. Maybe a little, I don't know if it was like that. I mean, they, I think it was just maybe bad planning with the whole, you know, anything mm -hmm. and then not securing one, somebody early enough, like a rider they wanted. Um, I mean, looking at it, it's, I mean, it's so many ifs and buts of what could have been. I mean, if you look at what happened, I mean, they got Vinales. They were angling for him, so I am i don't know where I would have fallen. Um, I mean, I know I would have done well on the bike, but for my own thing, it was, it was just like I wanted to win, you know? And I had come so close that year yeah. in Moto2, you know, and hadn't won a race since Moto, Moto America days. So it felt like I was finally getting a grasp on this thing and this, you know, Aprilia thing had come on really late and it just felt like, no, I believe in myself. I know I'll get to MotoGP. You know, I know I'll make it happen. I don't need to take this last minute thing that, yeah, on paper it looks really good. And the bike ended up being a really great bike, of course. But um, I can't be upset with myself. You know, it was out of anything selfish. It was out of like self-belief and like being like, I know I can win. You know, if it was like being selfish and made the wrong decision or right decision you know i don't know i was just there felt a point afterwards you like looked back at it and you were like you know especially once they started doing well you were like man, i wonder what i could have done on it oh for sure man i'm not yeah. like stupid i'm not yeah. crazy yeah, you know yeah, of course yeah. i was like oh man that bike's doing great <laughs> i'm at a shit race <laughs> <laughs> you know that sucks but yeah. I, you gotta just keep going you know yeah. what am you i gonna eat it what am i gonna no, do 100%, 100%. but like so you didn't there was no like rumors or rumblings you know because like it just happened last race and there was no yeah like, that's just how quick and that was it? Yeah. And then when did it happen? Before the weekend or after the weekend? During Friday. So now how much pressure did that put you under for the weekend? Dude, I couldn't ride. I was like <laughs> looking around. I was riding I was, like, <laughs> terrible. I was looking at the cameras. I was like, man, are they, like, is people watching me right now? Like what's, it was a lot of weird stuff to go on. Um, yeah, I qualified terrible too. Uh, qualified like 18th or something. <laughs> I actually pulled it together on Sunday. I came through and like finished sixth or something, which was a pretty decent result. Fought through the pack, but and is that something that you just, I mean, say 
did you have to go through the weekend before you made a decision or did you know right away, hey, I, I got unfinished biz, business in Moto2? Like, did you know or did you ponder it through the weekend? And no, then, I pondered it through the weekend, yeah. but then come Sunday and had the result that I did and I thought, it's a good team I'm going to and I know I can, I can win. Yeah. So, yeah. I had read somewhere that uh, you kind of like consulted with Dovey a little bit about. Is that that kind of got a little bit blown out of proportion? <laughs> yeah. Honestly, I, I, he just I was just walking past him in the paddock, and he just asked me, and he's like, "Oh, so what'd you end up doing?" And I was like, "Oh, I'm gonna stay in Moto Two. And he's like, "Okay, cool, good decision." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that really got <laughs> blown out of proportion. Did, did anybody offer you like? Uh, did anybody tell you you like 100 percent should take it? And yeah, there's people country? saying you should, just people you shouldn't, well, like people you actually like trusted in to to kind of help you make the decision there was people that i really trusted who said i shouldn't go and there was a lot of people that i i trusted that said i should yeah but i mean that's something when it comes down to it you just gotta look yeah you gotta go with what you want to do for sure yeah Yeah. that's awesome that's difficult that's tough i can't imagine i mean because selfishly like that's your dream always right from like the moment you start racing is like you want to be the very top so it's pretty hard to like turn that away when you have it kind of in your lap in a way you know yeah, but I guess looking back, you look at like Remy Gardner wins the Moto Two champion, goes up, doesn't do a bad job. Like I mean, he wasn't great, but he didn't right. do a bad job. And dude spit out a Moto GP. Yeah. Like you know, I feel like if you go up, it's kind of you got to take some sort of risk. But the, it's I think it's got to be the right thing, and it has to feel right to you and the right package and all that. And I guess uh, that kind of leads me into like how hard is it getting? You know, the seats they move so quick. Like GP round two. You know, if a big figurehead moves, then three seats get signed and stuff like that. Is it like at Moto and Two as well? The thing gets signed pretty quickly, like before the summer break, or yeah, it de- I w- well, I mean, it depends. I think last year stuff was dragging on past the summer break and stuff, but yeah, things like get figured out pretty soon in the the paddock. I mean, that's why you got to make like pretty good impression first half of the year. Yeah, it's super crucial. Like, yeah, and now going into that the MotoGP season, do you look at it as one season? I feel like it's kind of like three seasons in one. Like you see people that come in hot and then they get to the summer break, they come back and it's like they lost a little bit. Like they're just maybe not in that pocket you're talking about. And then maybe they come back, maybe they don't, they start crashing and whatnot. And like, you know, I feel like you can see people like, it's almost like cycling a little bit with peaks, you know, like people come in and they peak too early and then they're nowhere towards the end of the season and stuff like that. How hard is it being in a MotoGP season being so long? Yeah, I mean, that has its, like, mental toll on you. I mean, especially for, like, I think it's easier for the Euro guys because they get to go home all the time. But somebody, like, American or maybe from Asia or something like that or Australia, they have to make the commitment to, like, fully just either move there or you're just bouncing back and forth to home, which is not ideal. Um so that like mentally is yeah it's difficult man i mean you're away from home and uh i think after a while you start to like hard sometimes hard to keep that focus all the way through or if you have a bad result it can kind of like take you down a peg a little bit you know yeah and are the you know when you're traveling in the flyways going that far like not a lot of sleep you're sleep deprived this that and the other um you know, your first year doing it, how difficult was it, like, trying to figure it out? Did somebody kind of show you the ropes, or was it, like... No, I was, like, pretty much by myself, just traveling with the team. But it was exciting, man. I'm seeing the world and seeing all these places, racing tracks I, like, dreamed about racing. I mean, it was exciting. And the, you know, the food, was that hard? (laughs) 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 The only place I struggle with the food is, like... Carnivore diet. (laughs) Dude, (laughs) yeah. I mean, I don't really like eating steak on a race weekend. Cause I feel like it drains too much energy from me. Um, but yeah, like places like Argentina, I struggle there cause I'd hear all these stories, like meat. people eating the food there and it being bad. And then you'd be like throwing up all night. And like, that's like my worst nightmare <laughs> before a, a race. Can't even imagine. So Dude. I remember one year, actually, like my first year going to Argentina, I heard all these like horror stories about the <laughs> Just food. Just didn't eat for the whole weekend. <laughs> no, like people were like, oh, there was like worms in my food. And like people tell me all these crazy stories. What? Yeah. And uh, so I, I remember I packed like a carry-on bag filled with like beef jerky, protein bars, <laughs> like green powder to replace like salads, basically. All PB2. This, all this like protein powder and all this stuff. And like 
I basically like smuggled it into Argentina. <laughs> and uh Could you imagine I got that to headline? customs. I got to customs like sweating. Yeah. I was like, shit, they're gonna find all this stuff. They're like, hey, it's hey, like yeah. hey. but it was funny and I got so sick of protein bars after that. I, bet. I, I can barely eat one now, honestly. <laughs> but um but yeah, the food stuff, I mean, yeah, like Asia too. So, there's some places that are better than others. Um Thailand's not too bad. Like the food's pretty decent there. Um, I mean, you can always like nowadays, like there's so many of these, like, like, uh, I feel like the surf thing has like influenced like the surf cafes, oh, Australian yeah. breakfast places, you yeah. know, there's like, that's like infected the whole world. There's just these like nice cafes everywhere. You, you know, big Yelp guy, like, like <laughs> how, how do you search that stuff out? Like how do, you, I mean, you just, I, I just go by like what I feel when I show up to the place, okay. look at it. And if it looks good to me and there's, it's pretty, if it's like packed, I know it's good. Yeah. No one's going back to somewhere. They just got food poisoning. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> if I it's do. empty, I'm like, okay, I'm not going in there. You know? Are you, uh, I think I want to ask what's your favorite track? Like, I mean, you, you've raced so many good tracks now, like so many. Now, do you look at your favorite track as the one that you've done the best at or the one that, like, there's some tracks that I I love, but I've got the worst fucking results, man. Like, every time I go there, I dread it. Like, Brands Hatch, man. I struggle, can't get it, but I love that track. It's yeah. so cool. Is there a track like that, or do you have a track that you've done super well at, and it's just like, every time you show up, like, maybe Bruno, you're just like, guys, like, this is it. Like, I'll see you in... In the rear view. <laughs> <laughs> Bruno, I thought that way, honestly, because I just have always had a special moment there. Like, dating back to... I got my first Rookies Cup win there. Top 10 in my first, like, Grand Prix there. Um, so, I, I've always had, like, a special love for that place. But it's not in the calendar anymore, yeah. which kind of sucks. But um, I'm a big fan of Phillip Island, but I have had that same thing where I know that track I could do super well at, but I've, it's never kind of come together. Kind of almost did this year. I felt I had some speed, but um, had a couple issues in the race and had to retire. But yeah, that's another one of those tracks I love. I think it's so amazing. The place is cool, but it just never has come together for me. Um, Portugal, I love a lot. That's a crazy track. Crazy track. And on paper, I feel like it's not something that like suits me super well in a way because it's got all these tight kind of things. But I just have found a flow there that just feels so good and i i really love that place what do you think it takes to be um one of those guys i mean there's like a seems to be a group of guys throughout the year different times but but sometimes most of the year that is at the front what do you think it takes to be kind of rounded enough to be one of those guys at the front at all the tracks i think it's having the the good support around you with the team um a good headspace that can last a whole year that goes back to your like way you're living at home, all sorts of stuff. Just very, I think it's just like your headspace, man. Um, I mean, I'm figuring that out too, you know, I mean, that's what I feel is the right thing right now Mm. is just surrounding yourself with the right people and feeling confident in yourself and not losing it. You know, it sounds a bit like I always found like the beginning of this year, I found this feeling that it's going to sound funny, but it felt like a little like energy in myself. And when I like focused on it, it was this feeling of confidence that carried my, like, I don't know. I just, when I followed that, I could do something really good on track. Mm. And when you feel that, I feel like if you have that through the whole year, I think you'd have a great season. Have you ever worked with a mental coach? Yeah, for sure. I have. Like what, uh, like going into this coming season, is that some of the stuff you're working it sounds like men- mentality type stuff is more what you're focused on right now yeah for sure i mean that's the, i'm focused on what i can control you mm-hmm. know the things i can do which is like my training my mentality and just going out there and getting it done yeah, yeah you for know sure. for sure i had a kind of going back a little bit on the gp thing but have you had any other offers since then um i've had some other stuff come up and stuff yeah but obviously nothing like worthwhile well, I don't know, man. I want to get into You still want to get You still want to get The juicy stuff. You still want to get the job done in Moto2, no matter what. Is that like a solid, like, the end of this year, factory Yamaha calls you, 
Like, are you still staying? No, I want to stay in, in Motu. Uh, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> dude, come on. That is so <laughs> loaded. <laughs> yeah. Factor Yamaha. I dude. know, but it's like, you know, that was, yeah. your, that was your reasoning back then. Is it still kind of the same thing for you? Like, you still have this unfinished business type of feeling no matter what, and that's a that's a strong hold for you on, on moving up? Or are you like... I mean, I want to have a really stellar year this year and do really well and win races and win more races and be on the podium more and try to contend for the championship. I mean, that's that's what I'm going for. Uh, obviously I want to be in GP. I think that's where everyone wants to be. So have this, I think I have to do what I'm saying in order to go up, mm. you know? So there's no other way to really think about it. I never really try to think about GP and like, if I do this, it will mean this, you know, because that's just all ifs and buts. And what actually matters is what you get done. Yeah. hundred percent. You know, what do you think like the, the future, like in the GP class is in terms of, where things are going or what do you, if you could pick an ideal scenario, what do you think that would be? What, where I would want to go? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh man, I don't even know right now, to be honest. Um, Seems like it's like peculiar going into this season, like which brand is kind of the, the bike that's going to well, start to take take stuff. Obviously Ducati's always got the upper hand. It seems like the last couple yeah, of years. Yeah, Ducati's but. always killing it. Um, I have been really killing it recently. I mean, that bike looks pretty, pretty great. Um, I'm curious to see what like Aprilia will do now with the satellite team. Mm -hmm. You know, having Miguel. I, I think, think Miguel is a really great rider. So, so uh, um, I think I'm he's very underrated for sure. Super underrated. Yeah, I think I'm really curious to see what he'll do. Um, is there a uh, is there like a team? You know, you've got like uh, like Paul or Jorge. They said like Repsol Honda. That was their dream as a little kid. Is there a certain team that you're like, you know? Ducati Red, like I want to see myself. Is there a certain team that you, if you could have any team you could go to, that you is your dream bike team that, you know, in MotoGP? Like, do you know what I'm? Do you understand what I'm saying? I, yeah, totally. I know what you're saying. I mean, I've had a lot of influences over the years. I mean, Repsol Honda with Nikki <laughs> has been such like that would be sick, right? To do that. Um, I mean, Jorge with Yamaha and Ballet with Yamaha. That's been a, like that's a sick package. My dad was always a big Ducati guy, so I've always felt a little bit of connection to Ducati in a way. I guess, like, maybe my question is you can go back in deliveries, like, like you know, maybe not 2023 bike and okay. look. So, like, oh, I like, I wish it was marble. You yourself in? Yeah, like marble, you know, <laughs> I Ducati. See, I see him going back Lucky Strike days. Dude, for sure. <laughs> you see me going back yeah. that way. <laughs> I can uh, see Joe, it. A couple umbrella girls yeah. sick, hanging out. Yeah, I feel <laughs> Just, a little bit that energy, honestly. Maybe like Just, Barry Sheen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sucking yeah. a Roberts. dart. <laughs> I would love that, honestly. Um, yeah, honestly, one of those days would be sick. Yeah. <laughs> do you think it would be but, cool to ride like a 500 two stroke? Are you kidding me? Yes. That's <laughs> like, so cool. Do you think you like instantly just high side your face off? Or <laughs> I'm, like, I'm very curious. I, I mean, yeah, I feel like yeah, the yeah. tires would be like, no, they probably have tires for it now. Yeah. Yeah. But um, no, I'm very curious to it's, see what that would be like. I, You know what I never got to ride was a 250 GP bike. Dude, I did. I mean, not GP, but I got to ride a 250. And like I rode a 125 GP in like USGBRU or whatever, and I was just horrible. Like I already moved to 450s and stuff like that in dirt tracks. So I'm just like, like, burr, 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 and I'm just getting smoked. I just remember just getting smoked. But when I got a 250. The thing was sweet. That thing was wheelie. It was so light. Like, not typical James Rispoli style because you can't like hang it out like in the way Is that, that your style. Well, I, I definitely think I'm <laughs> yeah, like I'm loose. loose. I think so. <laughs> like I think like if I could wear a cowboy hat, I would. Right. You know what I mean? Uh, but it was wild. Like there was so much power. It would just. It was so stiff. I remember I got to just. It was one time, and I'll never forget it. It was so. It was super smooth. It was awesome. It was like yeah. probably one of my favorite bikes. I think it would have like torque all the way through. Wild. Yeah. Yeah. Like it feels like uh like a four fifty. Like you just got like you have torque and you wanna spin it, but like I mean, I wasn't spinning at that age. You know? <laughs> <laughs> like I was crashing. Yeah, it looks like it would have been so fun to ride. But yeah. I feel like you kinda have this like eclectic style about you. How would you kind of describe yourself in that in that way like can you define that <laughs> you've always had like this kind of like old school vibe about you and i think that's kind of you know puts you a little bit different than most people uh, especially as things kind of go in a different direction style wise like you look at guys like fabio and them that are wearing <laughs> like you know yeah. uh, all these kind of gucci outfits and stuff like that you're kind of 
more more old school style is that you know wh- where does that come from uh i mean it's hard to kind of like look at yourself and define like what you how you are you know i feel like that's like interpretation of someone else but i mean i've always just taken influences from like friends i have in new york that have cool different styles and things like that or um maybe old bands that wear certain things from like the old olden times (laughs) like what's your favorite old school band then Old school band, oh man, that's like so hard. It's like asking okay. what your favorite movie is, man. <laughs> All right, I mean, dude. It's... I mean, I love like, I feel like some of my favorite bands, I love The Strokes a lot. They're one of my favorite bands, but they're early 2000s kind of thing. Um, oh man, I don't know. There's so many. Like Stone Roses, I think are really cool. Brit pop band. <laughs> okay, all right. Yeah, there's a few, but. Do you, would you be like, like a rock star if you, like, is that something that, if you weren't a racer, you know. I mean, wouldn't you want to be a rock star? If you were a racer? I mean, <laughs> it's like the second best. Right? I mean, hundred percent. Why not, man? I would be like, just lead guitarist. You know what I mean? Just yeah, yeah. Your brother's like a pretty successful actor, right? Um, yeah, he's done a couple of things like Netflix shows and stuff. Yeah. yeah. Did you ever like consider going that route instead? Like you, that's kind of what I mean. You have like that vibe about you. Like you could oh, yeah? kind of go that direction <laughs> if you wanted to. You know what I mean? Uh, dude, it's funny. I had like my brother's agents at one time like you got to try it you have a like, commercial look you should try acting i remember we went to remember that one time we went to like, oh, went to a casting and you got your truck towed oh you were there for that <laughs> was yeah that was like the last audition i ever did i think it's because i got my truck towed. that was like an ihop commercial oh man they're yeah they asked me they're like they're like this is the setting you're at you're at six flags you just got off a roller coaster you're with your brother you want to go get some pancakes all right go and I remember going like, "Wow, that was that was a that was a sick r- roller coaster, right? Let's go grab some pancakes." <laughs> like, stop, stop. <laughs> we need a little more enthusiasm. <laughs> you just got off a roller coaster and you want some pancakes. I'm like, all right. First of all, if I just got on a roller coaster, I need like a seltzer water to settle my stomach. <laughs> I'm not trying to go eat a stodgy pancakes right now, you know. Did they know like, you were a racer? Like that? That's like. Yeah, maybe that's the whole thing. I just like didn't really yeah, give a shit, exciting, you know. Yeah. I was just like, this is stupid, you know. <laughs> I want to go ride my bike, you know. But um, I mean, at times I think it would be fun. Like, there's a lot of movies I love that I think would be like it would be sick to like be in it. Steve McQueen is like such a huge. I, I mean, like so many. You know, it's such a huge idol for me and like been watching a lot more of his stuff recently. So if there was like something artistic and cool, maybe I'd like would love to try it. I have no idea if I'd be good at it, mm. but I think it would be fun to try, you know. Yeah, yeah no, for sure. But I, I got more stuff to do with racing. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah no, for sure. <laughs> let's not, let's it's not like get ahead of ourselves. Yeah, it's hypothetical. hypothetical, you know. I feel like we just see you in that in that vibe. So it's like pretty easy to talk about, you know. OK, cool. <laughs> <laughs> what uh you know i think i think a lot of people kind of chalk you up to that like california surfer boy vibe like in europe is that kind of the same type of thing like do you have that kind of persona about you like people are always trying to build these storylines right like do you feel like you fit in that mold the way that they try to make it out to be or is that just overhyped yeah no i think anything like americana in europe is super over exaggerated yeah, you know the sure. whole look California walking down Hollywood Boulevard, you know, it's like, I don't do any, I don't think I've been to Hollywood Boulevard, like walked on it for 10 years or something, you know? So maybe that's not true, but (laughs) (laughs) found myself there some nights, but, uh, yeah, maybe, uh, in the off season, of course, of course, of course, you know, deep in the off season, deep 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 in the off season. season. Fresh out of the last yes, race of the year. And you went for a 10K run in the morning. Yeah. yeah. That's no big deal. No big deal. <laughs> then I got went for the grind the next yeah. <laughs> Um But yeah, there is that whole thing, you know, it's just like, which is cool to play up for sure. I think Hollywood has always been a bit over the top and, you know, they make everything exaggerated. So, um, but I don't know, man, I just do, I just do my thing and get up in the morning and do my thing and go to a coffee shop, maybe get a breakfast burrito, walk down, do, you know, it's just like, a, I'm just a normal dude doing oh, my yeah, thing. For you know? sure, for sure. I know how that goes over there. <laughs> yeah. What about, uh, I mean, for, for the ladies out there, <laughs> oh, what's, the, yeah. what's the deal? Where, where, where are you at? Where am I at? Yeah. yeah. What's it like being the American playboy in Europe? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Is it hard? <laughs> no, it's not hard. <laughs> Do you have bodyguards? Huh? <laughs> oh, and hard. Oh, like yeah. keeping oh, them off. Yeah. You know what I mean? Oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> you still, I got to figure it out, man. You got to have a system, a little bit of like a, 
approach to it. But uh, I don't know. I have like the dating apps. Okay. Yeah. But I'm trying. I don't know. I'm trying to settle down, man. I think I think that would be How really good for me. I'm 25. Settle down, 25. Well, not like settle down, okay. but you know, have some uh, I've, something steady. Something steady. Okay. I'm at that point. Would you bring your chick with you on the road? If it was like the right situation, she was the one. If she was the one, <laughs> she really <laughs> spoke to me. <laughs> Do you think that would help you? Or I don't know. I'd see a lot. Of, that's a, it's a really something I was thinking about. It's a lot, like an interesting thing. Like you see a lot of successful athletes that have like someone by their side. And, you know, kind of 22 rock. and they've got like a wife and a kid already, you know, that was, blew my mind. I was like, what what the hell? But it kind of makes sense in a way. Um, but I think it has to be the right person. Yeah. I, don't, I never wanted to surround myself with people that affect me in a bad way, like toxic things. So I'd, I'd never like jumped into relationships, you know, found myself just kind of floating around. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> is, it, uh, is it being over in Europe, is it like at the races, is it pretty tough? Is there... So a lot of hot chicks. Like, what is it? No, there's a lot <laughs> like, of dudes, man. It, it's a pretty it, like, a like. There's a lot not, of dudes. Is there, like, is there groupies? What is it? I mean, I I, I feel like. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Joe. Got him under Come pressure, on. dude. <laughs> <laughs> there can be, but it's not always the thing I'm looking for. Yeah, of course. You know. Yeah. No. It's. I mean, I'm, I can only imagine being over there, especially where it's a lot more like pop culture to be a racer. Like, when you're trying to do your thing and stay focused, like you're not yeah. trying to get into that as much. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> maybe after. You. But maybe, maybe after. You. I definitely maybe taken a trip to Lisbon to meet somebody before. Okay, all right. What's the what's the wildest what's the wildest one you've had in terms of like lengths that you've gone? You, like you've literally just flown to Lisbon to meet with somebody. Yeah, just straight. You got to take a chance for love. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like shot in the dark. This is what we need right was here. It, what are you was talking it a, about? Was it like a blind thing? You just like showed up. It was a blind thing. Yeah. You flew really? a blind thing. Yeah. How far is the flight? Like, well, give me that. <laughs> well, the great thing about Europe is everything's Pretty. quite close. It was only about an hour, yeah. two, two hour flight. Um, did you rent a car? Or did you? No. Oh, okay. Lisbon's a, a good walking city. Got my exercise in. How'd it work out for you? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, she was great. But it wasn't wasn't the one. She wasn't the one. Do you think she'll know if she listened to this podcast? She, I don't think she'll listen. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, All that's right. great. Yeah, but uh, no. Where else did I do that? Yeah, I don't know. This, I don't want to incriminate myself. <laughs> I incriminate myself. But yeah, you know. Yeah. There. Yeah. There's been some some friends along the way. <laughs> I yes. love it. Yeah. Nice. I think he got to. Yeah, you have to, man. Dude. You know, this like you're traveling the world. What do you I mean Yeah. You gotta live. You gotta live, man. You gotta love. Got a lot of respect for <laughs> that, that too, love. you know. <laughs> yeah. No, I do think there's something to be said for the stability and, yeah, and having agree. somebody like you know, that you know is in your corner no matter what, is there's something to be said for that for sure. Yeah. You know, ride think, or die, baby. Yeah. I think some people definitely like know that from early on and some people it takes a little bit longer to to sort that out for themselves that they kinda want some stability, whatever the case is. You know? I feel like there was a stigma early on too, like if you had a chick at, when you were young and like being professional that was like, Oh, you're gonna get distracted and this, that and the other and then for you sure. see like, you know, some of these motocrossers and supercrossers, like they're super young. You know, and they get better. Well, you know, the thing is, I had a girlfriend that was like that, like a bit of like a didn't want me, like it was a bit of a distraction from the racing thing too. You know, yeah. So, like, she didn't really understand the thing. Yeah, the you lifestyle. gotta. I feel like you gotta have somebody that you can spread your wings with. Yeah, it's tough. It's a selfish sport. I mean, any any like anything that you're like at, trying to be at the top level at. It's yeah, like so much. It's pretty personal. hard to climb to the top with with a backpack on. Right? <laughs> I mean, it's it is. Yeah, but it does take. It takes a lot. It takes a certain type of person that's willing to. Yeah, totally. Kind of do that. I, at least I feel like you know. It's yeah, same. Yeah. Jimmy's girlfriend just moved all the way over from from Netherlands. I mean, dude. Oh I'm yeah, you you got a, a Dutch. Dutch. Yeah, yeah. Dutchy. Nice. <laughs> yeah. That's cool, man. Yeah, it is pretty cool. I like Holland. I think it's cool. It's super cool. It's wild. Yeah. It's a fun time. They don't really have their own food though. They kind of just what do you take, mean they got French fries, bro? Yeah, they just kind of take from everyone else. And stroop waffles. Yeah, waffles <laughs> <laughs> and, and mayo. <laughs> oh, dude, have you not had the mayo there? Maybe I don't know. You got to. It's not really on the diet, it's a, dude. I don't. Yeah, it is. It's a delicacy. <laughs> it's a, you know what I have had is in Amsterdam. There's this like pie spot called uh, Winkle something, 
and it's the best apple pie I've ever had in my life. Really? Yeah. What's it called? Winkle? Winkle I'm gonna text 63 my or right something. Now, seriously. <laughs> you should, like, yeah. Dude, are you kidding me? You didn't take me here? Yeah. She, <laughs> uh, she might know it, honestly. I bet. It's in Amsterdam, but it's banging. Now, I've got another one for you. What's uh, what's your opinion on Kemby coming back to the U.S.? Were you kind of bummed to see him leave? I'm bummed he didn't tell me sooner. I was hurt. <laughs> 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 I had to find out through the media. How could he do that to me, man? I thought we were close. <laughs> <laughs> Did he ever um, make salsa when he was over there? I, you know what? I actually tried his, his, his hot, sauce. hot sauce. He's a hot sauce guy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I tried know, his hot sauce. Salsa. I, we briefly like lived in the same <laughs> apartment complex before my apartment got flooded. And uh, yeah, he made me a hot sauce one night. It was one to 10. Let's do it. Like, I thought it was good. I thought it was too like hot. A, I'm never going to give a 10. I think. Yeah. Can't. I think it was like, I think it was 8.5. He wasn't super stoked with it. Oh. But was I, it because I was. He was, was he overseas and couldn't get the ingredients that he I normally I think it has? was that, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Fair point. But it was good. Give me a little good. leeway. Um, but I, I don't know. I think Cam's like, I have a lot of respect for him, honestly. I've, I've always looked up to him as a rider because he's, he's, he's older than me. I think he's like three or four year, years older than me. And uh, so he was always the reference, you know, when I was a kid. I remember meeting him at uh, Thunder Hill when I was a little kid and I was so stoked. I might even ask for a photo. With him. <laughs> <laughs> we gotta take that one up. Yeah, but that would um, be so funny. But I think yeah, coming over there, coming from like a super bike, which is a totally different style, and then showing up and being competitive right away, I think was pretty impressive. But I mean, yeah, he's got his thing, you know. I think he's got a good deal going here, and he's got a baby on the way and all that. So I think it's a good deal for him. I think he has some results over there to be proud of too. I mean, it's not an easy class to just make an impression on you know 100 percent. i think i mean personally i think people didn't expect him to do as well as he did like i, I think, think it was like, very yeah, underrated. He's a little bit old to go over there whatever the case is yeah. and i think people like got I mean, a lot more respect for him based on what he did yeah i feel sure, like he sure. had a couple of good charge races from behind and passed yeah. some top dogs late we Let's, had some yeah we had some yeah. fun battles this year actually so like does yeah. it matter though like so he's like or you got sean but he's really your only other american in there are you passing him clean or are you just going oh for no it? what are you kidding i'm passing right. as dirty as i, <laughs> I can love it. man all right we had some last i remember it um <laughs> where was it uh indonesia it was the last corner last lap and i stopped <laughs> yeah. I, just, I just sent it right in there because i had a terrible race i like qualified really bad i was 19th or something and i was coming through and i think it was a spot i think we were battling for like 11th place or something but you know, well, he, was, like, he was right there. I was like, I'm not, this is it. I'm going right down to the last corner. And Now, do you think like Top American has anything to do with it or is it just another spot? Oh, I don't know about that. I mean, yeah, maybe, but to you, another, just spot, another spot, another spot is another spot. Another point, some more points. You should ask Jake Dixon about that, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Barcelona 2019, we we're battling for uh, 19th place or 20th place. <laughs> and it was like, we were both on KTMs. And the last lap, last corner, Barcelona. And <laughs> I was like, I don't care. It's another person. I got to pass him. And I, I tried to do the Valentino <laughs> last lap, last corner pass in Barcelona. Totally messed it up. <laughs> I like lost the front, plowed into the side of him. I saved it, but he went <laughs> into the gravel crash. <laughs> Dude, and he was pitted right next to me. Was he pissed? Oh, he was so, dude, livid. He, he gets hot. He was so. livid. He came into my box. He's like, you do it, man. <laughs> last place. <laughs> Oi. I was like, hey, it's another spot. It's another spot, man. Dude, I'm that's sorry. so funny because I crashed in front of him in Super Sport and BSB, and we're actually friends now because of it. I crashed in front of him at a shell at an Old Park, and it's this banked corner, and I high sided, and he just ran into me. And then he got up, and I'm just like, dude, I'm KO'd. Like, I am hurting. I'm on my knees and everything. And he comes up to like slap me in the head, and of course, I took like four other people out during it. So, like, <laughs> They're all my, coming my up guardian angel Ben Wilson came up and was like, "Hey, you!" And then ever since then, we became friends. But I'll tell you, like, he's definitely one of them guys. He is. If there's any daylight, he's he's taking it. He's one of those. He is cutthroat, and we'll yeah, laugh we- laugh about it later. So it totally cool. To yeah, do it like well, it wouldn't because make... he would do it to you for 19th. Well, that's what I was, what I said back to him. I was like, Well, you wouldn't have done that. 
Fuck you no, know? he would have, dude. Yeah. <laughs> Fucking Laza, dude. <laughs> is there one guy, we were talking about this yesterday, is there one guy, like you always kind of have that guy in your class that you, when they're behind you the or freezy. around you, you're like, the eh, freezy. The freezy. The, the freezy. <laughs> oh, the person who like gets in, like. Not, not even like hits you, but just like you're always kind of like a little bit worried about when you're in their vicinity. Who's the last guy you want behind you going into the last lap? Oh, dude, there's, there's a corner. few, honestly. I mean, there's some like the Italian riders that just like, they'll just throw it in there it doesn't matter what you know um, but is there a guy like is there a vince freeze oh, i'm trying to think <laughs> hey. he's just the class example <laughs> dude vince you freeze. just got he's a verb dude <laughs> i mean there was a there was a minute there that jake was just kind of really throwing it in there to riders um wow dude dixon i never thought you'd be the guy on the pod <laughs> dude. Uh, aaron Kinnett sometimes oh yeah can be a little bit like that um maybe yeah i don't know alonzo lopez too some of these guys like, sometimes don't think they're mm. thinking when they're riding, you mm. know? But so that, just, maybe that's why they're so fast. I think that's a certain type of rider. Yeah, it's sure. a certain type yeah. of rider. Some guys who just turn it off. And... Yeah. But they also can <laughs> crash huge, too. It's <laughs> yeah. wild. Yeah. Um, well, we're getting pretty pretty deep on time. What One thing that I was going to hear is, so obviously, things have changed even since you started uh, as a kid, and it's getting more and more difficult. It's not getting easier. But what, what would you offer as advice for kids that are kind of watching you right now like they want to be you right yeah but it's funny things have changed a lot since I was a kid you know when I was growing up I kind of grew up in this like last surge of I think it's coming back now there's a lull for a while for the American like road race scene especially in the mini stuff it was like maybe like two kids that are racing against each other um I was lucky to like grow up with a time of like a lot of good riders that kind of trickled into like the AMA days racing 600s um racing like USGPRU and all that but um I mean I think yeah I I mean the thing is is like when I was racing it never I never like thought of it like okay I'm gonna be a MotoGP rider you know it was only until I got to like rookies cup or even racing 600s in America that I thought like oh I'm this could be like an actual future you know and maybe that was a good thing for me because it was more just like a thing that I did with my dad that we just had fun and um, let it like grow naturally in my own head. Like this love for what I'm doing and like the speed it wasn't like a forced thing. Sometimes I see these like moto dads that are just like so intense, yeah, yeah. you know, and it's like, do you want to be Rossi? Do you want to be Rossi? Or naming their kid that, you know? So, yeah. you know, it's just like, uh, I think there, yeah, I don't know. I think there's that. It's just trying to be, patient with it and right now the good thing is like the gp age has gotten a little older so there's a little less pressure to like jump yeah. straight into it which i think is a good thing but yeah just enjoy it i think getting over to europe is a good bet trying to get into that kind of scene and seeing how those guys ride and all that i mean there's a whole structure there man the kids that are racing and it's just because i know everyone talks about it all the time but really you see it like they've got little mini gp teams for kids that are 12 you know yeah it's crazy data guys and all that i mean i didn't have a data guy till i was like 17 <laughs> yeah you know even like racing my first year of 600s honestly till i got to moto 2 european championship i never had looked at a data sheet really i was like didn't even know what any of the graphs or anything meant you know it was just like working on my throttle control my breaking points and trying to like beat the next guy and feeling that competitive thing you know yeah and do you sure. think like you know, when you went over to, was it CEV? Mm -hmm. So did, like, do you got to do it right away? I mean, obviously it costs money, right? So like, depending on who you are, we all know, like some people get better deals and whatnot. And yeah. if you're a good talent, you can get on some good teams. Now, you know, is there a difference in going over there when you're super young and just paying a boatload to get there? Like, what do you think? Uh, I know everybody's a little different, but do you think getting there as early as possible? I don't know nowadays. I mean, I think making an impression right away is good. I think you can build, if you can make an impression on these teams, they'll take a chance. Yeah. You know, prove, prove to them on their own stomping ground that you're better than all the rest. I think then you have the chance to have like a deal that's like lasting and not coming up with 300,000 euro to play, you know, to pay your way. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I was pretty lucky that I got kind of the deals I got. I yeah. definitely had a lot of luck to get where I am now. That's um, I think that's you have to. Yeah, I mean, considering it seems kind of crazy the situations I've come from to get to where I am now, um, 
I mean, I've definitely like worked my ass off, but uh, yeah, you could have to make make this cliche about make your own luck. You know, it's yeah. Any anybody that wants to get to the top, that's it's got to take some kind of luck. But you have to put yourself in the yeah position to to be there. Yeah, but I think getting over there is a good shout. Um, you think CEV is probably the ticket? Is that like how was that super hard? Would I mean AGR is a pretty good team, like. They were a pretty good team in that series, right? Yeah, they were. I kind of gel- I gelled really well with that team. I worked with a guy that I grew up with. Um, like he had helped me with my 125 days, and he was okay. managing the team. So I already had a feeling of like com- I was comfortable being in that team. You were at the party with your boy. Yeah. And he, everybody else is pretty cool with you. <laughs> yeah, I yeah, had okay. a crew chief that was cool and showed me the ropes and taught me like breaking techniques. You know, um, sh- taught me how to use a rear brake, all those things. Because like I never had done all that stuff from racing road racing but even being a dirt tracker you never really tried it i mean i wasn't like a huge dirt tracker you know yeah. so like i did i just did my own way you know mm-hmm. so i learned I, I would study with agr like jonas folger rode for them marcel schrotter so i'd study their data constantly the different braking techniques how quick they like got to full power i remember seeing this like braking uh, map where they'd go from like off throttle to 12 bar like right away and that blew my mind, like, when I was, like, first getting on that bike. It, like, took me a while to, like, you know, I used to just build into the pressure, which that was more the Honda technique. I feel like now it's, like, actually better to be a bit more progressive with your braking. Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah, just different things you learn. So all that stuff, I guess the point is all that stuff will come. Just be patient. Yeah, okay. <laughs> sure. And have fun. And have and have fun. <laughs> right? I think people take it so serious. Well, you got to, but, man, if you take the fun out of it, you see so many people just get burnt early, right? There's a time it'll all be very, very serious, and there'll be a lot of money and stuff behind you. So while it's, like, li- li- not like that, have as much fun. Yeah. yeah. I got one last one. Do it. You got to do it. This is your question. Let's go. <laughs> This is it. This is a big one, What's buddy. This, one? this, this is, big. is a special, special guest question from my girlfriend. Um, if you were on death row in jail, right? Don't want to say why. If you were on <laughs> death row, <laughs> what would your last meal be? My last meal? Yeah. Ooh. Make it good, buddy. There's a burger from LA called For the Win. It's like a smash burger. I probably would have that. What is it? It's it's like it just it's just the most plain burger. simple burger. There's nothing in it. No, it has it's it's more than that. Okay, talk it's a to potato us. Potato bun. Really? Potato bun. It's like a smashed kind of burger down. What's and in it? Cheese and pickles and this special sauce. Do you know what's in the special sauce? I don't. It's, it's a special. What sauce. What does it taste like? <laughs> what's the sort of like an aioli mixed with Thousand Island? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um. And maybe. I don't know if I was about to be on death row, maybe a big bottle of tequila or something tequila, to wash it. That's your drink, okay. that's your drink of choice. <laughs> that's a drink of choice. I don't know. Like maybe that would be the nicest way to go. So, right. are you doing French fries or no? I do French fries. Okay. Yeah. Sweet or regular? <laughs> sweet. What the hell? Is sweet, sweet French potato fries. fries, man. Come on, sweet potato oh, fries. Oh, sweet potato. No, what? No. Last full meal. On. We're going full starch. Oh, full. Okay. Now, are you doing like one patty or two? <laughs> We're doing three patties. Oh, that's it. Ooh. That's what it is? I mean, in and out my my order is 3 by 1. What? How often do you do Pro- in and out, big dog? Not that much. <laughs> <laughs> I did it on the way over here. here. <laughs> <laughs> I did it on the way over here cuz that was the only thing on option. Cuz we're deep in the off season. <laughs> <laughs> Duty ran 10 no Dude, I worked my ass off today, yeah, right? Yeah, right? I saw you I saw out, you out there. there putting motos in. Keeping up with with Greg White's brother. <laughs> 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 well, uh, we really, really appreciate you coming on, being the first guest. It was, uh, it was kind of cool to have you come out and ride for the day, and then do this. this is a cool way to do it, I think. So, what? Uh, how, how can people find you on the internet? Um, it's pretty simple, Joe Roberts Racer. That's how. You can, there you go. <laughs> this is my Instagram handle. But yeah, thanks for having me out, man. It was a really fun day, and uh, yeah, I had a good time talking with you guys. Yeah, thanks for the giving us some stories that people that <laughs> they might have not have heard or. And giving us some good insight, man. It's been it's been a pleasure for having you for our first podcast. So we really appreciate it. Cool. After you get that dub this year, we can we announce get- the the GP ride on here. All right, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sounds good, man. Cool, cool. Right. Appreciate so, it. Thank you, man. Yeah, thank you.